Hey, thank you all for coming. Welcome. And we're going to first have a few words from uh, Director of NCAR, Jim Hurl, to welcome us this morning. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bill. And it's certainly a distinct uh, pleasure to be able to say a few words at this symposium in celebration of one of NCAR's top scientists, uh, John Gilley. And I certainly want to begin by expressing some welcoming comments to uh, all of his friends and his colleagues over the years who are spending this day with us here at this symposium, and especially, especially those of you that have uh, traveled um, to come and participate. I know it means a lot, not only to John, but to all of us. Often when I give welcoming remarks to groups at NCAR, one of the comments that I often make is that uh, a real asset of being at NCAR, and certainly a great pleasure that I have in terms of serving as director of NCAR, is that we have a staff of about 850 <coughs> incredibly talented and dedicated scientists, engineers, technicians, administrators, all of whom are extremely devoted to advancing our mission of improving our fundamental understanding of many different facets of the atmosphere and how it works and how it varies on a range of time scales, as well as the other important component of our mission, which is supporting, enhancing, and extending the capabilities of the broader research community, both nationally and internationally. And in my view, there are a few that illustrate this devotion as well as John has through his career. I'm thrilled that through this symposium, we have an opportunity to spend a day, and I'm sure a day is not long enough, but it's nice to have a day uh, to acknowledge John's distinct and extraordinary accomplishments in terms of research, in terms of community service, in terms of his support and leadership of NCAR programs, and in terms of his leadership of atmospheric composition satellite instruments such as Moppet and Hurdles, just to name two. And I know many of those aspects are going to be dealt with in much more detail throughout this day, so I'm not going to say too much about the specific research here. But I do wish to note that these instruments in particular have provided novel advancements in satellite measurement and data retrieval technologies with significant and very long-lasting impacts, not only on the work that we do here at NCAR, but very importantly, in the broader community as well. And it's certainly true that through his work and through his research accomplishments and his many contributions to our community, he has enhanced NCAR's reputation as a leading center in atmospheric chemistry and composition research. And for that, John, we are extremely grateful. And as great as all of these research and technical accomplishments have been, and it's very appropriate to celebrate those here today, I also just want to close on a bit more of a personal note in terms of my personal observations of John. Unlike many of you, I have not uh, had the opportunity in my career to truly work with John as a colleague in terms of a research project. But I have had the opportunity to get to know John over the years. And one impression that he has always left me with uh, in terms of my interactions with him is that he always has a smile. He's always very, very professional. And he's always conducted himself with a great deal of, of dignity and professionalism. So I just want to close by thanking you, John, for all that you have done for NCAR and continue to do, all that you have done for the community and especially thank you for the honor of being here today and having an opportunity to say a few words. So enjoy the day, enjoy every minute of it, you deserve it, and thank you very much. Now how do I make the screen come back? It's on here. Oh. They don't let me play with computers here. It's been this a million times already today. Mm -hmm. 
is broken. Oh, there we go. Oh, right. And now, uh, how do I make this be a slideshow? Just here. Right there. No, that's not. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so welcome. Um, so I'm going to give a little talk, but I'm first just I'm going to say, say welcome to everybody again, and thanks for coming, especially to our people who have come from out of town. Uh, most of the speakers, here's, here's an overview. You've already seen the, uh, the, the schedule for today, but we're going to have a couple breaks and lunch. And I want to highlight this reception at the end of the day at 4.30. Please, everybody, everybody's welcome to come over in our, in our uh, atmosphere chemistry building in the atrium over there, and we welcome everybody to come. Um, so I'm going to give a, just a brief uh, overview of, of John. John's history and highlights in NCAR. And this is intended to kind of set the stage for the day and give a little history. And um, I, I, I want to mention also, this is going to be recorded. So we would like to have as many funny stories about John during the day and embarrassing moments that we can have for posterity on our, on our website. So please feel free to contribute as, as you can. Um, so John came to uh, NCAR in 1972. He spent eight years at Florida State before that. And this is an early picture. Now, John must have been in high school when he was a professor <laughs> at, at, at Florida State University, I figure. But then he, he had been a visitor to NCAR for a number of summers. And he came here as a, as a scientist in 1972. And the, the key things we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about today, are, are his, his leadership in terms of very important and uh, long-lasting uh, major satellite instruments that have been really <coughs> community leading and uh, leading the science across the whole field. So, th so they're, these are the main instruments, the LRIR, the LIMS, URs, the Clay's instrument, the Moppet instrument, and the Hurdles instrument. And I'll say just a few words about each of these in turn. The really novel uh, aspect of, of much of this research is, is, is limb sounding, looking at the limb of the atmosphere from the satellite as opposed to looking downward. And, and the key aspect of, of, of that was highlighted in this very early paper in 1971. Uh, and this is really highly referenced paper on, on <clears throat> the theoretical aspects of, aspects of limb sounding. And the key aspect is, is very high vertical resolution. So you can get <clears throat> a kilometer or a few kilometer resolution by looking at the limb much better than, than downward looking. So this, uh, this was in 19, early 1970s, and John followed this up over time with, with proposing and, and being funded to fly instruments that do, do this. So the first instrument was called the Limb Radiance Infer, uh, Inversion Radiometer, LRIR. It flew on Nimbus 6 in 1975. Uh, so it was novel, it was a cryogenically cooled detector and it had four channels. It was gonna measure temperature, ozone, and, and uh, intended to measure water vapor. I don't, did it ever measure water vapor, John? I don't know, did it? Yeah. Let's see those. <laughs> anyway, so here's a really nice picture. This was groundbreaking technology, and uh, it was kind of proof of concept that, that this, this uh, type of uh, measurement could, could work, and can, you could do the inversion. So here's a very nice profile comparing the uh, <clears throat> satellite measurements in the, in the, in the dots versus the, a nearby rocket sun uh, measurement. And you can see it captures the, the high vertical structure and interesting wiggly lines there. So that was uh, <clears throat> kind of, again, that flew in 1975. The, the really groundbreaking work came in kind of the next instrument. I think L, my, my impression is probably LRIR was, <clears throat> they worked out some of the bugs and, and, and LIMS was really the first instrument that, that really uh, <clears throat> pulled it all together, if you will. So LIMS flew on Nimbus 7 and it flew for about six months. It also had a, a cryogen in it, so it has an intended a specific light, lifetime that the, the detectors needed to be cooled. And so it measured temperature, ozone, water vapor, nitrogen dioxide, nitric acid, kind of novel measurements for, for a number of these species. Uh, so here's a picture of water vapor that came out of, out of limbs. It was really some of the first measurements of these species. And, and it, <clears throat> it set the stage from 1978 and 79 for, for about the next decade, I think, in, our, in, in the field of stratospheric dynamics and circulation, a uh, <clears throat> number of uh, kind of seminal papers on, on planetary waves, equatorial waves, the global transport circulation, the Brewer-Dobson circulation. John went on to publish a number of 
fundamental papers on radiative transfer rates and in the, in the, in heating rates in the middle atmosphere, the deduced brewer dobson circulation, um, tropical circulations, a number of people uh, looked at the behavior of equatorial waves or influence on how the QBO is, is forced, for instance, and gravity waves, uh, some of the first work on global, global morphology of gravity waves. When I came to work in the group, Eric Fetzer was a student. Um, Eric now is a scientist at JPL, but he, he was doing his thesis research on, on, on gravity waves and limbs and published some of the, a couple of papers that are still kind of standard references in the field. Um, so this is really a long lasting, I was talking to Ann Douglas yesterday and she told me, <clears throat> for looking at long, you know, 30 year time scale variations in the stratosphere, this limbs data point back in 1979 is still a very fundamental constraint on our understanding of the whole long term variability of the middle atmosphere. Um, okay. The next, so, so this, so now I kind of came along, I, I came to the group in about the late 1980s, um, and it was just about a little bit after that, the, the URs instrument launched, and, and URs had a number of great novel instruments kind of following on from, from limbs, and it was a, a decade later, but um, John was involved with, with data retrievals for the Clays instrument. So Clays was another limb sounder, another cryogenically cooled instrument, um, and John was kind of helping lead the, the data reduction activities. So I, I came into the group and my, my job kind of was, was looking at the data and trying to look at, <clears throat> we, we like looking at waves and circulation and stuff. So, so here's one of the nice results that came out of the, the Clay's N2O measurements. Uh, you can just kind of see with your eye the Brewer Dobson circulation upwelling in the tropics. So N, N2O is a tropospheric source gas that goes into the stratosphere and is, is broken apart. <clears throat> by radiation in the stratosphere. So you can see it decreases with altitude. You can very clearly see the circulation in these, in these contours and also this little, uh, <clears throat> this little arrow here is, is, is the so-called surf zone where there's lots of large scale planetary waves acting here. And we actually saw some really novel, interesting results. This is a sequence of, of maps. You can actually, we, I remember making horror maps and sitting around with a group with John and Paul Bailey and, and Cheryl Craig probably and we were <clears throat> it's like, oh my gosh, what's this big big wavy thing coming out? You can see the sequence here is a big chunk of stuff breaks off from the tropics and, and goes into mid, middle latitudes and it's a it's a planetary scale feature that's as big as big as a continent it comes in and, and these are kind of happening all the time and we came, came to appreciate this is really a fundamental aspect of, of the large scale transport. Uh, and kind of we're seeing for the first time in, the, in these chemicals from, from URs. Uh, and I liked it so much I ended up just kind of staying in the field for, for the next many years. Um, so the next instrument is, is the Moppet instrument I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk very much about this. But the whole afternoon session is going to be on tropospheric composition. We'll hear much more about Moppet, but, but it's really also set the, set the uh, set the stage for much work in the field. Moppet is still flying. It launched in 1979. It continues today. Oh, I'm sorry, 1999. But it is still continuing. And, and as I'll bring it up in a minute, it's, it's really fueled the research in the community, but also the fueled the research at, at NCAR. And the, the, uh, it's also led to other work, uh, extension, for example, to Yazi and AIRS data we've been looking at that employ similar techniques to Moppet or, or qualitatively similar measurements come out of these satellites. You can see work in the division right now is, is looking at Yazi. So here's an interesting picture of a, another, you know, continent scale wave breaking feature uh, in the atmosphere that we can we can observe with these chemicals. And um, one key point that has come out of the, the Moppet work is a contribution to development of chemical weather capability in, in our division. So this comes about with the synergy between the, the satellite measurements and the, and the global scale modeling, but then also data assimilation and learning how to assimilate the data, improve the models, and be able to do forecasts. So out of this has come daily weather, daily chemical weather forecasts uh, that, are, that are on the ACD website. They, they are updated every day. We can make forecast analysis for fuel campaigns. We do it at high resolution, low resolution. Uh, and it, it's one of the one of the main features that's going on in our division and, and in all of NCAR, and in fact, the wider community. And this has kind of come out of these uh, these global global satellite measurements. Just to highlight that, that this has been recognized by NCAR, the uh, the Moppet team won the uh, the coveted uh, technical and scientific advancement award, and 
So this is the, this is the group here, and this is a, 2007, I think, this award, or 2006. Everybody's happy here because you get a little award, but you also get some money. So that's, <laughs> everybody was happy on that day. Um, okay, and the, the last thing I'll talk about briefly is, is Hurdles. So Hurdles was this uh, <clears throat> novel collaboration between the, the U.S. team and the Oxford University team. Uh, I guess they were, they were initially they were separate proposals, but they were quite similar, and it was uh, deemed a good, good fit that these, these teams would join. And it was, I think it was a very good fit over time. And uh, so John Barnett, who has who has died in, in the meantime, but John Barnett and John Gilley were the PIs of this and led a very vibrant and exciting and just a, a, a first class uh, instrument team or two teams. So this is a, just a picture of our of the hurdles team at NCAR. I'm not sure the exact date, but um, many of the people here today are, are in that picture. Um, so kind of the highlight early on was was I mean this took a decade. I remember when hurdles was being proposed, and it was like in the middle 90s probably, and it just takes a decade to put these things together, and, and then you wait and wait, and the launch got delayed, and uh, but it, but. Launch finally happened in July, and, and and many people got to go out to the launch. We, I, I, <clears throat> probably many people again in this room were at were at that launch, and it was really a happy time. It get, kept getting delayed, and I think it was not a bad deal because, <clears throat> for for me, example, I had golf clubs with my friends, and we would <laughs> as we were as we were waiting for the next day's satellite launch, we would go out and collaborate on the golf course or something. <clears throat> But anyway, so so the happy picture of the of the PIs on the top there, and the the instrument fire, the, uh, the the rocket finally did launch, and uh, it was a it was a really happy day, I think. Um, soon thereafter, we found that, or John found, or the team found that there was there was a really important problem with with the hurdles instrument, <laughs> unfortunately. So what hurdles was intended to do was was very have very high horizontal resolution, very high vertical resolution, a kilometer. It was going to be a novel instrument, and it's intended to to sample and understand all these little filaments that are that are that are occurring in the atmosphere, and how do they contribute to transport and mixing, and and unfortunately, during the launch of the of the of the, of the instrument and the satellite, this is the field of view, and there's supposed to be a scanner that went, went horizontally across here, but this piece of kapton in, inside the instrument fell down and blocked much of that whole view, except this little corner over here. And it turned out that, well, first of all, he's like, boy, <clears throat> tried to shake it and make it go away, but it wouldn't go away. <clears throat> so so is, is, is the mission ruined? And it turned out it was not. You could look, take the, the scan and look to the far side, and there's a little bit of signal over there. And the problem is it's just a little bit of signal, but it was enough, and the, and the instrument was such a high-quality instrument that they were able to take that little bit of signal and, and, and remove <clears throat> the big signal, which is this black thing, and, and it took years to figure out how to do this correctly. But it was really a Herculean effort, I think. It really turned something that was going to be a disaster, frankly, into, into a successful thing. And this, this is, I think this is one of John's legacies, is, is leading this effort and, and keeping the crew together and the dedicated effort it took to understand fundamentally the problem and attack it and, 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 and do retrievals with that little bit of signal. And, and it, is, it has worked. So here's a picture of some details from John's overview paper of a couple years ago about how they did that, and it, it works reasonably well overall. Uh, so a number of key science uh, results have come out of this mission and are, will, will still be out of this mission. So here's some pictures of, of waves in the tropics, equatorial waves. On the left are symmetric Kelvin waves. On the right are anti-symmetric Rossby gravity waves. You can see they're very you know, quite narrow vertical resolution, but, but a few kilometers. So hurdles is the, is the one instrument that can do this. Uh, again, having this very, very high vertical resolution. Another uh, key result that, is, that has come out is looking at using that high vertical resolution in, in the UTLS region to understand ozone transport. And this is something uh, <clears throat> groups have been looking at for a while is, is a so-called double tropopause structure. And this, this occurs because of, of transport above the subtropical jet, you can see this low ozone being transported here, <clears throat> and it also transports dynamical features that result in that double tropopause. This turns out to be a very fundamental aspect of, of circulation in UTLS, and hurdles is the only instrument that can, can really see this. So there's been a number of papers published, and John had a, a graduate student, that, uh, Tanya Peavy, that did a number of key work on that. So 
Hurdles has really been a, a, a success in, in the long term and will, and will continue to be. Uh, I just want to make a mention that I, I, I sometimes show this slide when I talk about ACD science. Uh, that there's really three key aspects to ACD. There's in situ measurements, chemistry modeling that's global and regional scale, and, and satellites and, and remote sensing activities. And they're really kind of hand in hand. We more or less about one third of the people do do each each of these activities. It's the synergy that that lends the value to ACD. And ACD is really the only place in the community that has these three activities going on in in collaboration with each other. And I have to say that much of the success, or, or co completely the success of, of the ACD satellite and remote sensing activities is due to John's uh, initi initiation and, and, <clears throat> and carrying through and lead leadership throughout the years. And, and frankly, uh, the, the success of ACD over the last many decades, I, I have to put <clears throat> thank, thank John for this, uh, his leadership and, and, and many of the things we do. The people that are here, me, I wouldn't be here. Uh, <clears throat> David Edwards, Laura Pan, Andrew Gettleman, Mike Coffey, a number of the people that are now in leadership positions uh, <clears throat> are, are here because John brought us here, basically. So thank you to, to that for John, to John for that. Okay, just a pretty picture. Uh, John's also been a valued friend and colleague, and we've had some very fun trips and places and exciting adventures. So this is a picture of, a, of John and Ellen a couple years ago at a meeting at the, at the uh, Brewer Dobson workshop in, in Switzerland. We went to visit, this is on a train somewhere. And after you, you take this train, we were going, on, going to visit the Jungfrau Yoke. Uh, so this is, a, after you get off the train, you get out and it looks like this, and you're kind of on the top of the world. And, and here's, here's John and Ellen over here. <laughs> but what you do is you go, you go into this mountain here and then you take an elevator and you go, right up here is, is the, uh, there's a, this is where they make the measurements. It's, it's a fantastic place, anyway. Uh, and anyway, I'm done. I'll just say thanks again to John and congratulations and thank you for your contributions. <clears throat> Okay, we're gonna, I'm not going to, that was an overview, I'm not, there's probably not any questions for that. So I'm just going to lead us to the next, I'm already a little bit past time here, and we're going to go to the next talk. And um, remind me of the schedule. <laughs> it's Masato, okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Bill Randall for uh, arranging and inviting me at the, such a uh, very unique occasion for celebrating the Jones, re can I say retirement, or <laughs> and the good symposium for this occasion. And uh, this talk is a kind of my personal history in relation to John, and I'd like to show some the work done with uh, John uh, in the viewpoint of the global scale waves seen from the satellite observations, and that is closely related to the wave mean flow interaction in the stratosphere. So the, I started my research activities almost over the 30 years ago, and the, under the supervision of the Professor Hirota. And at the beginning, he gave me a one paper uh, describing an, a, a kind of a general uh, review ab about the uh, middle atmosphere, and that the paper written by John, and uh, that the middle atmosphere processes revealed by satellite observation. That was uh, really the, my first paper. Uh, I read about this the uh, research uh, area, and uh, for example, in can I? Yeah, in the left hand side, he showed the uh, result, the ozone cross section, uh, ozone latitude height sections, and from the LRIR. 
And this is not from LRI, but I think it's from the SCR and in the southern hemisphere and to show the phase progression uh, along the time in the southern hemisphere. And the, we see some the interesting, the eastward tra uh, traveling wave, particularly for the wave number two. So this is wave number one, two, and three. And so uh, it's quite new to me and to see such an award. So it was so exciting to see the uh, to see such a uh, very new and uh, atmospheric area. And so during this time, at the same time, then around the end of his paper, uh, he showed the uh, picture taken from the Hartman, and he made an uh, analysis about the uh, heat flux and also the momentum flux for the southern hemisphere. I think that the, uh, so at that time, uh, we, we, we don't have any, we didn't have any information in the southern hemisphere. And so uh, this is particularly uh, interesting uh, to me that the, now we can see the information even in the southern hemisphere. And also, and he noticed the importance of the, such an uh, uh, flux, wave fluxes heat flux and momentum fluxes. And, but at this time, the, uh, he, John didn't mention about detail about the wave mean flow interaction uh, in the framework of the uh, Andrews and McIntyre. And this is an, uh, I'm not go, going in detail about those equations, but the, uh, so uh, around the same time, so the, uh, Andrews and McIntyre proposed in a kind of a very nice framework of the theoretical framework about the uh, area and palm flux and transformed Eulerian mean equations. And this can be used uh, very uh, usefully for the analysis of the global scale, the data set derived from the satellite. And so the, I studied the, those, the theoretical framework and also I uh, try to use the uh, global scale data set for my the graduate study. And it's just uh, 30 years ago, and around the, this time, November, around the end of November, and we had an uh, international map, so Middle Atmosphere Program Symposium in Kyoto. And this, actually this was my first time to participate such an uh, international the symposium. And also John uh, attended this symposium. So you, you remember <laughs> this time? <laughs> <laughs> and so he presented the, with the title, the transport of tracer species uh, deduced from rim observations. So RIMS, uh, well, RIMS observation, and, and co-authors with the Larry Ryder and then Smith and Paul Berry and Steve Massey and uh, Smith. And uh, this is a picture taken from the abstract and the figure taken from the abstract and uh, he's describing that the, uh, so he, he's, he tried to explain the uh, time change of the ozone uh, in terms of the transport, uh, transient circulation, and diabetic circulation, and also the advection by total residual mean circulation related to the uh, EP flux. And so it's a beginning on, of the, uh, such a good uh, a time to see that the uh, way, uh, uh, theory and observation is in very good, uh, co 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 good, good relation. So I can say that the, good observations uh, follow the good theory and also the good theory follow the good observation. And at this symposium, I have one presentation uh, based on the uh, EP flux framework. And particularly, I'm interested in the difference between the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And uh, for this symposium, I made a Movie uh, to in, to show the 
zonal wind and also the EP flux on it. And this is 30 years ago. So the, this movie was taken, the, the series of picture uh, of the screen uh, capture. <laughs> so it, it took too long time <laughs> to make the, such a movie. <laughs> and the, uh, at this time, I'm very interested in the, uh, particularly the difference between the northern and southern hemisphere. And I'm not sure uh, John remembered this uh, movie, and also I, I'm not sure John remembered the, my presentation, but the, after this uh, uh, international symposium, John kindly gave me a chance to stay in Encore for about one year. And so that's an, uh, a new start to my uh, academic career. And uh, uh, during my stay at Enker, I did mostly two works. One is an extension of the uh, uh, analysis about the planetary wave activity. But in this case, that I am interested in the uh, relation between the troposphere and stratosphere. And this is a uh, time height section about the vertical component of the EP flux. And it, it may not so be easy to see, but the, uh, I can say that the, at the beginning of the winter, uh, we sometimes see the negative correlation of the wave activity in the troposphere and stratosphere. But the latter half of the, this picture that the, we see in a, a kind of a progressive the propagation of the wave activities from the strat that troposphere to the stratosphere. And, and then made in a kind of such a detailed analysis uh, you by, based on the EP flux. And another one uh, is in a uh, kind of uh, dynamics in the southern hemisphere, climatological uh, picture about the dynamics in the southern hemisphere. And this time uh, is just, in a, uh, just after the discovery of the ozone hole. So many people are looking at, many people looked at the uh, southern hemisphere information and so the, I'm not a chemist, but the, uh, from the base point of the uh, dynamicist, I made a kind of a basic the analysis uh, describing the uh, dynamical futures in the southern hemisphere. And those, uh, it was so nice to me. So the, uh, it's a kind of very memorable period to me. And, I tried to dug out some of the pictures during this time. And this is the, I, do, do you still have such an race uh, up to the hill? Yeah. So uh, this is a picture taken at the relay race and uh, John is an, uh, one of the uh, relay runner. And I think the John and the, his wife and the, he's an, uh, uh, as the division director at that time? Yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I have a uh, very good friend at around that time, and John. And <coughs> so, so this is a picture taken probably at the uh, last uh, lunchtime meeting, uh, just before my departure, uh, going back to Japan. And yeah, John is here. Steve Mousy and Greg Rogers and uh, Sherry Gray and Larry Rijok and Dan Puckman and uh, uh, Matt Hitchman. <laughs> and on the other side of the table, and <laughs> so you can see the, my coffee here and also the Eric Fetzer. And uh, in the Jones group, uh, there was a uh, very good assistance and Marina Stone and here. And at the same time, the uh, Guy was in Encore, and, <laughs> <laughs> and also <laughs> at this time, the uh, not the member of the Jones group, but the uh, Bill is already at the uh, Encore as an uh, ASP uh, fellow. <laughs> so this was a uh, really very good time for me and to meet those good old friends. And after that, the, uh, I had another chance to stay at Denker. Uh, it's about the 1992. And in between, the John had an, a chance to visit, to, to stay at the, in Kyoto 
for several months. And based on those, the kind of communication, I uh, kept continuing that the uh, kind of uh, research activities using the, the satellite data. And this is an, uh, one example about the uh, equatorial Kelvin waves seen in the Jones Crace uh, instrument, uh, Crace data. And uh, we can clearly see the uh, eastward progression of the uh, equatorial Kelvin waves with an zonal wave number one, one or two. And I, I can say that the Crace and is a very nice instrument, particularly about the temperature measurement. And so uh, we can uh, make a very good analysis about the uh, Kelvin waves in the equatorial region. And also, uh, I, uh, with my student, uh, I revisited the LIMS data to see the ozone Kelvin waves, uh, right, seen in the LIMS data. And uh, she's my uh, student, and uh, she looked at the kind of correlation between the temperature field and the ozone uh, Kelvin wave field. And it's also on a very uh, intuitive and very, uh, I think, uh, nice result. And also based on the craze data, as I said that the craze uh, is on a very nice uh, uh, <coughs> temperature soundings, and based on the craze data, we sometimes see the very uh, nice, the vertically stuck temperature disturbances like this. This is an, a, a kind of a longitude slice, a, a, a latitude slice at the specific longitude, and so latitude height sections, and over the equator, we clearly see the kind of an, uh, uh, pancake structure, first uh, revealed by the Matt Hitchman in the RIMS data. <coughs> and this, the uh, vertically stuck temperature disturbance is just anti-correlated to those in the subtropics here. And so we, uh, we did such an uh, uh, observation based on the craze data and RIMS data. And the year in 2000, uh, that was the, just an location of the quadrennial ozone symposium uh, in Sapporo. And I asked the John and also the Guy to present the, some, uh, so to, sh to present the, uh, some result for young student in Japan. And I call it a uh, maximal disciplinary atmospheric chemistry school for student. And so the Jong and Guy were kindly accepted my offer, and and they gave uh, John, for example, John gave an, a talk about the U.S. atmospheric satellite measurements, past and future, and Guy also gave an, a seminar about the chemistry of the atmospheric ozone on July 8th and 9th on the years 2000, and. Uh, I, I remember very clearly about the very uh, good message from John. So this is almost the end of his talk, and he he mentioned about the how to achieve a good observation, particularly from the satellite. And he said that the yeah, imagination as always it's a key, and serendipity lead to many things, and new scientific questions may require new observational method. And it's important to have clear measurement equipment. Yeah. And the technology may open new possibilities. And in instrumental development, a retriever code is essential for performing uh, instrumental trade-off. And this is a picture, I think, that before the talk or the just intermediate, of the, uh, just uh, intermission of the talk, the picture about John. And additionally, he said that the planning should uh, include the consideration of data processing and distribution. This shouldn't be until after launch, yeah. <laughs> and careful specification of instrument performance is important. 
an accurate measurement of instrument performance is much more important. And good physical data cannot be expected uh, from that radiance <laughs> measurement. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> So the John gave us an, a, such an, a very nice message about the, uh, to, to get a good observation. Yeah. And after uh, his talk, that we had a very nice uh, so dinner with students. And so that the, I have one picture at the time. And, and this, is, <laughs> this is a picture uh, when the, uh, John and Guy uh, was asked to do a self-introduction. And uh, yeah, uh, John's cheek is a little bit pink and after drinking the Japanese sake or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, uh, John and Guy uh, made a kind of sort of introduction at the, uh, during the uh, dinner with the student. That was a very, uh, very nice experience to me. And after those, the experience, after those wars from John, the, I had a chance to take a read of the Japanese satellite mission. So it's about six, seven years ago, I started uh, to take do this role. And I'm not going in detail about this result, but the, I uh, took a kind of responsibility about the Japanese uh, satellite instrument, the SMILES, Superconducting Submillimeter Wave Beam Emission Sounder, on board the Japanese experiment module of the ISS, International Space Station. And I, I think that without an experience uh, with community communicating John, the, I couldn't get such an, a chance to uh, take a role of this type of the satellite mission. Uh, I think it's very uh, important to me. And uh, uh, SPICE launched the 2009, and uh, three years after the launch, the, we did a kind of a, a evaluation meeting about SMILES. So last spring, we did, the, uh, so we have done an evaluation meeting of SMILES, and at that time, uh, John and uh, Guy kindly attended this uh, evaluation meeting, and uh, so this is a, a picture at that time. And this was held uh, in Tokyo area. And after this meeting, uh, we went to the Kyoto to attend another uh, international scientific meeting uh, related to SPARC. And at that time, one picture uh, is for this one. And now again, the John is here. An old friend, uh, Matt Hitchman, uh, Bill Rander. And again, now this time we had another new uh, friends, and so, so Ku and the, uh, yeah, Andrew Getterman and the uh, Karim Roser up here, and sorry, uh, we are just uh, every time we are just drinking the sake and <laughs> like this, <laughs> and so this is um, uh, this is an end of my talk, and ju I just would like to say to John that the. Uh, Thank you for uh, giving me uh, such a good experience uh, working with you. And thank you very much. Thanks, Masao. Any, any comments, questions? Might as well. <laughs> Ann Douglas is a, has been the leader of the Aura project for, for a long time. How long have you been in charge of that? Uh, since 2009. Since, since 2009. But I mean, with the project from 99. But, it, but she has a longer longer knowledge of John's activities in the field and all the things we've been, we've been hearing from my, myself and Masato. Ann has been there also. So, welcome, Ann. Thank you. So first I would say, I was just so, so honored to be asked to come and participate in this. And so I'm really thrilled that I was able to come. Um, and I tried to think of a catchy title. It's kind of kind of lame. <laughs> I, I, I actually spent like, like not sending a title, not sending a title, because I was trying to get a better inspiration. But anyway, we'll move forward. Um, Bill asked us for um, anecdotes 
And I, I feel that the last talk really kind of made the point that the scientific dinner is just like super important. So I was gonna come with an anecdote here, which Sean may or may not remember, but that's actually part of the point. So <laughs> <laughs> it was sometime back in the, I don't know, late 80s, early 90s. I, I have a pretty big family. I didn't go to meetings when my kids were young. So I started going to meetings somewhere in there. So somewhere in there, one of my meetings, late 80s, early 90s, it was a scientific dinner. It definitely was in beautiful Virginia Beach. <laughs> and it was a really pretty nice restaurant, kind of one step higher than what we normally go to. <laughs> and um, it was a pretty big group of people. It was mostly men. There might have been one more woman besides me. Maybe I was the only one. I don't know, but I was like taking it all in at this point because I was very new at it. And. Uh, there was a really nice waitress and her name was Betty. And the question was, how do you order wine for a big group? It's in a really big bottle. And when the bottle's empty, you go, another flagon, Betty. Um, and I don't know if you remember this at all, but this became, this is a legend in my family. In my family, I went home and I talked about the flagons. And then every meeting I went to after that, they would say, were there flagons? Well, now my kids are grown up. Some of them are scientists. There are other things. There's professional dinners. And guess what? There's flagons. So that's just telling you that something that can seem really, you know, just kind of in a moment can have a very far-reaching impact. So that's why now I want to talk about the LIMS data. So I looked at the LIMS website now. First global monitor of man-made and natural pollutants in the Earth's atmosphere. It's a pretty short period, but you know, there wasn't anything else for such a long time that it really got looked at. Um, I couldn't remember for sure when the data was released. It was before the ozone hole though, and I think that that's important because it really gave us a lot of time to think about it and look at it before everybody got excited about all kinds of other things and stopped thinking about it for a while. Um, Ozone temperature correlations, upper stratosphere ozone chemistry, the theory said that the chlorine depletion would be in the upper atmosphere and people were, that's really where a lot of the action was. It was thinking about what was going on high up. You go back to 1975 and there was a famous paper that uh, about ozone and temperature and that if you knew what the ozone was and what the temperature was, you could say something about what its temperature dependence was, you could say something about which chemical processes were contributing the most. Um, Rich Delarski, who sends his regards and wishes he could be here, and I did a lot of work on that in the early 80s. How does it work? And then um, in a paper in 1986, we went out on the limb and said, we think that adding chlorine to the atmosphere will change the relationship. Everyone didn't agree with that at that time, but um, I really felt confident based on my one-dimensional model and understanding that I had developed from this early data that this was going to be true. But then really, you know, by the time that paper, the papers came out much later than, than when you submitted them. So sort of in the interim, after all that work, the ozone hole is discovered and everybody, you know, the, the field just ran to the ozone hole and working on that. Everybody thought about that stuff for a while. But I didn't ever forget about it. You know, it's your early work, you think about it. So years are going by. Stratospheric chlorine is going up and then up, and then it's kind of leveling off. Lots of aircraft missions, finally URs, then Aura. The 1D models became 2D models and then 3D models. And uh, all this time I didn't ever forget about this stuff. And uh, I just put this in in case anybody, oh, anybody didn't remember it. Another thing that happened during that time was, thanks to the work of a lot of physical chemists, the kinetic input to the models really settled down. Back in the early 80s, someone would get a new reaction rate. You could write a paper. Um, <laughs> you can't do that anymore, because we all have to go by the JPL Bible, um, <laughs> which is a good thing, which is a good thing. But just, you know, you've got your main uh, chemical cycles. You've got O plus O3, which is most temperature dependent, and then you have the other ones. And CLO plus O, that catalytic cycle is almost temperature independent. So you just kind of keep this in the back of your mind throughout all these years and all these other things that are happening. And then you get a really good model, and then you look at how the ozone temperature relationship changes in that model if chlorine is changing and if 
chlorine is not changing just under climate change and you end up with this figure which is from a paper that's authored by rich to larsky but we did work on together and i really like this like this result because what it shows you is well you can write ozone as a simple function of a linear constant and temperature and then you use the annual cycle to figure out what's that b value and that's really telling you something about the different loss processes and when you look at this figure you so this is the simulation with chlorine changing from our 3d coupled model and this is if chlorine were constant and only only um, co2 and greenhouse gases were changing and you see this really cool chlorine signature but you also see you know in the urs and aura period you're just sitting here on the peak you're not really getting all that information what makes this figure interesting is the limbs point which is up here if you didn't have the limbs point you really would not have the confidence that we do that we really understand stratospheric chemistry and how it's changed over time and how it will change again in the future and so someday you know uh we cut this off at 2050 i someday we'll get back up there with chlorine as low as it was during limbs then we should check again and um see if we're really right um so uh yeah i put the star around the limbs point because the limbs point is really really the thing that that brings this whole result home the the early measurements and bringing the early measurements to bear with the uh more current ones well and the story doesn't actually end here because i use the same concepts i looked at all the different models that contributed to the future scenarios for wmo 2010 and they're all chemistry climate models and uh you know they diverge so these are all different models doing their thing with ozone and with temperature and um you can be a little depressed when you see a plot like this because everybody thinks they're using the same chemistry. So you're trying to figure out what's making this, what's making this different. Um, and uh, so they, they're the same in some ways. They all show this chlorine signature. They all cool by about the same amount, but you can see they start from very different places, although there's a core here in the middle. This X here is something about observations, and this is something about observations. Um, but you can also see that the response really differs among the models. And I would make the editorial comment that the chlorine change is actually specified by the boundary conditions, although when people look at models, they frequently forget that, um, because they think that getting that time dependence is a good thing, which it is a good thing, but you also told it to do that. So if you didn't, don't get it, you made a mistake. It's not anything of great significance. The photochemical mechanisms are the same, but there's an error in one model. And I'm also going to comment that we're supposed to be using satellite measurements to reduce uncertainty and prediction. So the last thing to notice in this is that these spread more here in 1960, and they come together somewhat when chlorine is high, and then they spread apart again. So that gives you kind of a clue as to what's going on here. And uh, you can show actually that the change in ozone that comes from that big temperature dependence, the models just line up on their difference in ozone from the mean. So the fact that some of the models are very cold and some of the models are very uh, hot actually explains a lot of the difference in the temperature, or a lot of the, dif the difference in what the ozone is. Um, they come together when chlorine is high because chlorine isn't temperature dependent. And uh, not to belabor the point, but if you look at what's happening in the base part of the model, and you say high ozone, low ozone, and then you look at its response to chlorine change, that is actually a pretty linear function. This model had a mistake in the chemistry, so it's kind of nice to have it there, um, showing you what happens when you have a mistake. And uh, this is the ozone response to temperature change. And that also depends on the ozone that you had to begin with or essentially is a function of the temperature. So basically what that's telling you is that um, you, you need to understand when you're, when you're looking at the differences among models, if you look at what's different in their, in their 
what they think is the unperturbed state often the response is related to that and then you can understand why they respond differently when i was maybe five or six years ago i was very uh, ardently supporting eliminating the models that you could show were um wrong in certain things uh there's no appetite in the community for that so i am now sticking to explaining why they're different because we shouldn't put it out there like we think we don't know why that happened when we can use data uh, to figure it out. So basically, I'm gonna conclude here. I'm gonna say models are nothing without observations. You know, I'm really thought of as a modeler, um, but it's been my good fortune to work, at, to work at NASA and to work with the various instrument teams and to really be personal and friendly with the data so that you, can always stay kind of grounded in what's what's real and what's what's a simulation or even in the simulation sometimes when you get right down to it a lot of how the models behave has to do with what you told them to do you know like and if they don't do you know and then if they did what you tell them to that's great but that really only means you didn't mess up it doesn't <laughs> doesn't really mean that much else um, it really is possible to reduce uncertainty in prediction, but getting there isn't easy. And I think that when I think about this and the upper stratosphere ozone, and I think of the limbs period, and I think of those few years that we had to think, we actually had years to think before we had new data. And that really actually made a really big difference. So um, I, I would love it if future scientific endeavors kind of kind of uh, programmed in years to think instead of just uh, what's the data today, what's the new data, and only caring about the new data. Um, stratospheric chlorine won't get back to 79, the limbs point, until about 2065. So I would put forth that we should make a new measurement then, make sure we've got it right. Um, and then uh, mission success, I think. Uh, nowadays, when you write a proposal, you have to say a few things. You have to increase understanding. You have to see if everything is going the way you thought it was before. And you have to do better with a prediction. You're going to reduce uncertainty in prediction. And people say that all the time. And the thing that I just love about the limb state and think is so wonderful is that it actually accomplishes all of those things. But Again, you have to look at this and think, well, it took some time to do it because it took the 80s to really increase our understanding where we, that was our first look and people had to think about it. And we were fortunate enough to be given the time and funding to do it. Um, then we got our later satellite programs and we began to, began to uh, see what had changed and you could look at the LIMS data in relation and you go, okay, do we really understand this change or not? And so that's a big part of the picture. Um, and then basically using the understanding and the current data and understanding how things have changed, then we're able to actually look at a bunch of different models, understand why they give different predictions, and basically thereby actually do it, reduce uncertainty in prediction. So I think it's an awesome accomplishment. And I think that the early data sets really, really need to be held up to the um, future generations of scientists so that they really can grasp the whole thing as we're trying to think about problems on decadal and longer time scales. So starting out with the dinner, it really actually fits together. I mean, like the idea that um, my kids go to scientific meetings and order flagons <laughs> based <laughs> based on a, a conversation that they had with me after one of my first meetings. You might never have thought that was going to happen. But in the same way, I mean, like I think the limbs data, it's like it's a legendary look at the atmosphere in a condition that, you know, it won't get back to until almost a century after when those me measurements were made. So I just think it's an awesome thing that we have that great data set. And so I'm going to say thank you. And thank you for your attention. Do we have any questions, Moran? Anybody else go to that dinner?
Huh? Are you bringing the flag on the side? I don't know the flag. I think someone else was in charge of the flag. I think you're going to have flags this afternoon. Yes, that's the answer. Okay, our next speaker is Mike Coffey. Oh, you ran away? He said a minute. I don't know how long. All right. So Mike, you might have to get a flag. I don't know. Is this a caption? I made some notes so I don't forget anything. And uh, so thank you for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. So it, in 1967, while John was a visitor to NCAR from FSU, he worked out that it should be possible to determine the temperature at the stratopause by measuring the infrared radiation at the limb. The limb, as you've heard, is the, is the tangent to the Earth's curvature or the atmosphere's curvature. Okay, and uh, in 1971, which you've also also seen, he and, and Fred House published a, a, a seminal paper, which was really the foundation of all later limb sounders called on the inversion of limb radiance measurements. Okay, so for microwave or millimeter wave or infrared, they're all based on that uh, paper. And uh, here's a picture of John in that era with Paul Bailey and Bill Mankin. I think hair was darker in those years than they are in these days. <laughs> uh, and this is the picture. This is a picture of the LRIR instrument, which was launched in 1975. It was the first such instrument on, on the Nimbus 6 satellite. I believe it was calibrated in John's garage uh, <laughs> here in Boulder. And you, if you look closely, you can see the bumper of his old Bronco right <laughs> next to it, which he had forever. Okay. Uh, uh, so it was the first one, uh, at least uh, the first non-military thing that was a limb sounder, probably the first of, of any kind. And uh, is that the, there's the button. I first started working with John in 1977 on a limb sounder, surprise, surprise. But it wasn't Earth limb sounder, it was a limb sounder for Venus called Vortex. Okay, and it was launched in 1978. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about instruments, mostly about instruments. Uh, so the infrared is just heat. And if you want to measure a small amount of heat along the limb, you have to have a detector which doesn't have any of its own heat. So the cryogen, the, or the refrigerator, the thing that cools the detector, is a critical technology for all these instruments. instruments. And LRIR contained a big block of solid methane surrounded by solid ammonia. Okay? And it lasted for eight months. Okay, uh, limbs, let me, where am I now? Okay, uh, so let me go to the next one. Okay, so this is a picture of the limbs. The limbs also had the same kind of cryogen that LRIR had, which was, which was ammonia and methane, and it also lasted about eight months. When the ice cube was gone, the instrument was, the measurements were gone. And it was uh, launched on Nimbus, the next Nimbus, seven, Okay, and John, by this time, has, has collaborated with Jim Russell. Okay, I think when John was in school, his report card must have said, plays well with other children, because, <laughs> because he was always a good collaborator. Okay, and, uh, and he made very efficient and useful collaborations. Limbs, I was at a meeting at, at NASA meeting a couple weeks ago, and I ran into a guy who was analyzing limbs data. Okay. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> he, but he was still analyzing LIMS data. Okay? And LIMS was, as you've already heard, was a great success. So, stepping through time, there were other instruments involved here. Here's another uh, uh, LIM viewing instrument, which didn't use a cryogen or a refrigerator at all, but used a radiative cooler to cool the detector. And this was a collaboration with CU, the 
Solar Mesospheric Explorer, which was launched in 1981. Okay, I've completely left my notes now, but that's all right. Uh, uh, we had some developments and studies that we did which actually never became instruments. And this was one of them. This was CLEAR, which was developed for the Space Lab in 1982 was the idea. And it had a, a big cryogen of, uh, I forgot what CLEAR's cryogen was, uh, but I've written it down. Uh, nope, can't remember. Uh, but, uh, but it was never, never pr uh, selected by NASA for flying on the space, uh, the space station. Uh, the other one we developed was Cooler, which we had we studied and developed for URs. And this one was not selected, but this is how we were, were put in together with the other URs instrument, Clays, because of our proposal to do Cooler. Now, it's just as well that Cooler wasn't developed, I think, because Cooler cryogen was 90 kilograms of solid hot solid hydrogen okay and so uh, and uh, it's probably just as well we didn't end up doing that hydrogen burns invisibly and in the plants where they use it they walk around with, around with brooms I'm told and so if the broom suddenly ignites you run the other way <laughs> uh, I haven't actually seen that Okay, so so we didn't we weren't selected for for the cooler instrument, but we were selected at, uh, for to be part of the uh, analysis for clays, which was made by Lockheed in Palo Alto. And again, John is now collaborating with another person, Aiden Roche, uh, and uh, with the with the clays instrument. And it was uh, the clays. Okay, was a cool by solid neon surrounded by solid CO2. So again, it's just a big chunk of ice that uh, when it's gone, it's gone. And I think, how long did clays last? Was it 18 months? 18 months, okay. Now John made a small diversion from limb sounding when he teamed up with Jim Drummond, okay, shown here, again, another good collaboration, to, uh, to work on an instrument that was not a limb sounder, okay. But he saw the error in his ways and he returned to the true religion with hurdles, <laughs> okay. But, but what he did do is, I think, it, but one thing about uh, this instrument, Moppet, is that it used a mechanical refrigerator. So we didn't have to have a cryogen, an ice cube on board that would go away. Uh, based on the, I think, the old Oxford technology of pressure modulator cells, uh, the refrigerators in here uh, were an excellent idea, and they were incorporated in, in hurdles. Okay? So he stole some information while he diverted from limb viewing. Uh, so this comes to the to the hurdles instrument, which you've heard about in, in some uh, detail, and with a collaboration with John Barnett, and uh, we can identify precisely where the error, I mean, where the problem with hurdles began. Okay, right there. <laughs> uh, and you've seen how it was uh, uh, was solved, and it was a great co uh, compliment to John that he was able to overcome this this. Uh, a problem with hurdles, and it has a mechanical refrigerator that worked extremely well for this entire life. Other things would come, would go, other things would fail, but the refrigerators worked very well. I might point out, since I've been talking about refrigerators, uh, John attended a pretty good university, by all accounts, Yale University. But there's some problems with it because it must have been there that John first earned his love, no, uh, obsession with puns. Okay, and he never met a pun or a turn of phrase that he didn't, he couldn't use or enjoy. Poor Ellen had to live with this all year, all day long. We only had to do it during work hours. Okay, he even had the opportunity to attend the second best university in England. Uh, <laughs> So while we're, this is the place for personal recollections, John was not a, just a connoisseur of puns. He was a, a real a gourmet. And I remember on one early trip with Bill Mankin and I made with John to Goddard Space Flight Center, John just, we all three went out to dinner, and John picked a place, the Sans Rival, it was called. It was a, a nice French restaurant above the, the range that Bill and I would have chosen, but we went anyway. And, uh, and so when we got there, Bill and I, trying to keep inside our per diem, we ordered a modest meal. John ordered the most expensive thing in the menu. And then a bottle of wine, maybe another bottle of wine. Uh, a flagon. 
And uh, so at the end of the meal, John says, well, let's just divide it three ways. So, so we didn't object, we didn't object, but then the next time we went to the Sans Rival with John, Bill and I just kept our mouths shut, and, and, and after he ordered, we said, we'll have what he's having. <laughs> So, it's been my very good fortune these 30 odd years or so since joining John's group uh, to work with two of the smartest people I ever came across, John Gilley and Bill Mankin. And so it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. during the day. And these are on tape, as I said. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a break, but, but before we take a break, John, will you come up up, up here? We, we have a, put together a little mem remembrance for you, and we're going to give you this nice picture of end card to remember uh, <clears throat> your time here. Uh, and what we're going to do is, you see there's no glass on here. We're going to leave this. We're, we'd like everybody that's here to... to Sign this today. <clears throat> Give a little memory or best wishes, or, or you can write your funny story on here. <laughs> uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to have this around all day. So I'm going to put this on this little table down at the end here, and at, either at the break now or at lunchtime or the break this afternoon, or we'll, we'll have it upstairs this afternoon. Sometime during the day, come and come and sign this, and John, you can have this as a remembrance of this day. So congratulations. Well, thank you. Day. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So again, it'll be over there. So we're going to take about a half hour break. So let's come back at, at quarter till uh, 11. Okay? And I think there's a refreshments and such out, out, out this way. Well, thanks for doing the first half of my time. <laughs> 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 